Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. From the ages of 4 to 11, I grew up in San Jose, California. So the weather forecast was pretty much the same every day. It was either going to be like sunny in 75 or sunny in 80. But then when I was 11, I moved to Missouri. And things became different on the road to Missouri. Instantly I knew something was going to change. We drove through Flagstaff, Arizona, and it was just dumping snow, right? I was convinced it was rain. And you may not have picked up on this, but as an 11-year-old, I was an incredible, smart mouth, obnoxious punk. Like, I would have punched myself now, probably. <laughs> just really rude, disrespectful sometimes, and said things before I thought about them. And so I was arguing with my stepdad, who was driving, that this was rain we were driving through. And he's like, no, it's snow. And I just kept arguing and arguing. Finally, he took his jacket and stuck it out the window, pulled it back in the van, and it was pure white. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm not as smart as I thought I was. So I became more interested, right? I love snow, never got to play in it much in California. We had to drive like to Nevada practically to find snow. And so I, I grew up missing exciting weather. We got to Missouri within a couple nights of arriving there. There was this huge thunderstorm that woke us up in the middle of the night. And growing up early 80s California, you know what big loud flashes and rumbles are when they come in the middle of the night? It's the Russians attacking. <laughs> That's what I was sure. The world was ending. And because, you know, we, we had all this talk about the Cold War and big scary stuff, and I'm sure oh, the Russians are going to get us. But it was a thunderstorm. And so then I became really, really interested in thunderstorms. And as we got cable in our house, which was a big deal at the time, right? We had more than three channels. We got something called the Weather Channel. And on the Weather Channel, you could watch storms coming across the whole country. And so I became, as this 11, 12, 13-year-old guy, fascinated with the Weather Channel. And there would be like severe thunderstorm warnings, which take a normal, boring spring day and make it exciting. So as a teen, young teenager, it's really something that I tuned into. And I wanted to see how storms grew and if tornadoes were coming and all this kind of stuff, right? So I began watching the Weather Channel way more than any normal person, certainly any normal teenage boy. I was watching the Weather Channel to find out what kind of storms are coming. Maybe there'll be tornadoes nearby, all this kind of excitement about the weather. And so... In time, that grew and grew, and I became interested in hurricanes. And so at this time of year, you can do this right now. There's a website called the National Hurricane Center. You can watch waves way off the coast of Africa that are coming towards the Caribbean and see the odds of that wave becoming a tropical storm and the odds of that tropical storm becoming a hurricane. Most people, not super exciting. But again, I have this weird interest in weather. So there was a, a big chunk of my life where I was kind of rooting for the storms, right? <laughs> Because, oh, it's only got a 10% chance. But I really want it to be a hurricane because it's boring if it's just a little thunderstorm. Right? And so I'd root for these storms and watch them come and watch them come. But as an adult, I began to realize sometimes those storms have really severe consequences. And it's not just a fun thing to watch on TV and root for. People can actually die or lose their homes or all kinds of bad stuff can happen. And that happened as an adult uh, in August of 2005. There was Tropical Depression 12. It formed over the southeastern Bahamas on August 23rd, and there was just this tropical wave that had kind of interacted with the remnants of one of those old tropical storms that never got to be named, just a little weak tropical depression. It was called Tropical Depression 10. But when those two got together, they strengthened, and it became something called Tropical Storm Katrina. Maybe you've heard of it. So over a few days, uh, the water was super warm, and all the conditions were right, so this thing just blew up into a hurricane very, very quickly, and it became Hurricane Katrina, which I'm sure you've all heard of. For a long time, even really knowledgeable forecasters thought this thing wasn't going to be a huge deal to the United States because of where it was hitting first on this little isolated part of Florida, and then they believed it would weaken once it interacted with land. But instead, it went deeper into the Gulf and got strong again. And you all know the story. It went up to New Orleans and flooded huge parts of the town. And there's a, a whole bunch of political fallout. I'm sure you all paid attention to the news where people decided the federal government didn't love certain people who were part of the society in New Orleans and all this crazy stuff that there's, there's really very little evidence for. In fact, at the time, Bush was the president. And he called the governor of Louisiana 
and insisted they evacuate the coastal areas, but they didn't do it, the governor of Louisiana. So read the details on that if you're interested in the political aspects of it at all. But it became famous because it was one of the top five deadliest hurricanes in the history of the United States. Over a thousand people lost their lives. And it was the costliest natural disaster in the history of the United States. Total property damage was estimated at $108 billion. That's $2,005, so you know, like $200 billion now with the rate of inflation and stuff. So just colossal damage. Four times greater than the previous, which was Hurricane Andrew in 1992. So some of you, many of you, kind of experienced that firsthand on the news, right? You saw pictures of these people. And Aaron, go ahead and show us the next one. Do you remember pictures like this? There were tons of them. People stranded on their rooftops in desperate circumstances. But there's another story from Hurricane Katrina that you probably haven't heard. A week before the storm hit, there was a lady named Janelle Simmons. She was, by all appearances, living a normal life with her husband and her five-year-old son. But two weeks after the storm, she had filed for divorce, and she was, according to her own words, gallivanting around the country with a new male companion because the storm offered a moment to act spontaneously on desires she would have otherwise ignored. This is her quote explaining why she did what she did. People were doing crazy things like they do in wartime. People were having a lot of sex with people they didn't know. It was just such a crazy time. That doesn't seem to me like the appropriate response <laughs> to a hurricane, right? But you'll see something there that's true of all of us. We reach for justification when we've engaged in behavior that we know wasn't the right one. And so if there's some big chaos thrown into our lives, that's a great excuse to go do whatever it is that I was going to do anyways. So this entire article that I'm quoting from says it was one of the lesser discussed effects of Katrina. Having already lost homes and the lives they knew, people found themselves using the storm as an opportunity to wipe the slate clean, ending marriages and walking out on relationships they felt no longer worked. But it, obviously that wasn't something that everyone would enjoy. There was a gentleman named Bob Murphy for whom the storm blew apart not just his house, but also what he thought was a functioning marriage. She changed quite a bit, he says, describing the woman who is now his ex-wife. Upstairs above his bed, he still keeps a framed copy of his marriage certificate, although his kids have begged him to take it down. I just want to remember, I never want to make that mistake again. So, little change in circumstances, and suddenly this commitment, this lifelong commitment that we made, isn't so important anymore. And it doesn't always take a hurricane. There's famous people you've heard of who've made similar choices. Remember the show John and Kate Plus Eight? Anybody ever watch that? I didn't. I can't handle that kind of thing. But <laughs> <laughs> they had eight kids, apparently, right? Good for them. So uh, these folks went through a divorce, which I think might be part of why the show's not on anymore. But this is what Kate had to say about her husband in the aftermath. I really th thought he'd have been in it for the long haul, she said. The weirdest thing is that overnight, he became a different person. So someone changed and the marriage fell apart. Here's another person that maybe some of you have heard of. I hadn't until I did the research. Kevin Bainton. Anybody heard of Kevin Bainton? Some people have. Okay. You pay more attention to celebrities than I do. So he was Guy Ritchie's half-brother. Anybody know who Guy Ritchie is? Me neither. He was married to Madonna. That's someone I've heard of. Okay. That's the first link in this story. So uh, Madonna and Guy Ritchie got divorced, and a year later, Kevin Bacon, the half-brother, also got divorced. And this is how he was described. He changed totally. It had a massive effect. Some people can keep their feet on the ground, and some people can't. So in case after case, circumstances change, people change, and we decide this whole marriage thing, maybe it isn't all it's cracked up to be, I want out, I'm done. And it, it can be... A normal person like us who goes through a hurricane, it can be a famous person who gets a little too much of fame and decides they want to turn a different direction. But that doesn't match up with God's standards for marriage. We live in a culture that doesn't care as much about God's standards for marriage as it used to. And you might recall we're in this section in 1 Corinthians that's really a unique opportunity. It's like your opportunity to sit down with the Q&A session with an apostle. Because these folks had written Paul a letter and asked questions, and we're still in that section where they're asking him questions 
about marriage. So if you have your Bible with you, turn in it to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to begin in verse 10 today. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And so we have a situation similar to what we've described. People are changing. You might recall from our previous time in 1 Corinthians that Corinth was famous or infamous for being a place where moral character was not the strength. Partying was what they were famous for, right? They had thousands of temple prostitutes. They had alcohol stuff going on. It was a constant party. Their, their name became a verb for living immorally. Corinthianized became a word in Greek to describe people who were living immorally. So they were legendary, like better than Vegas. They were famous for doing things they shouldn't have been doing. But then the gospel of Jesus Christ comes into this culture. So imagine you've been living your, your life like your pagan neighbors, just like everyone else around you, and then your husband or your wife becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. Imagine the chaos that injects into your daily life. Everything's different now. And so someone asks the question, hey, if this is our circumstances, what do we do about it? If we're Christians and we're married to this non-Christian person, what are we supposed to do? 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Okay, there's a, a bunch of things that I want to address just in those couple of verses. The first is you will read among people who are skeptical about Christianity, who are critical of some of the things we believe, that the Apostle Paul was a misogynist. Has anyone read that? He didn't like women for some reason. He was sexist in the things that he wrote. But look at those two verses and notice the weight is applied to both the husband and the wife. The same standard is placed on both of them. So married I command, yet not I but of the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband, and even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. You're supposed to stay together. Whether you're a guy or a girl, you have an accountability, a responsibility to remain in that marriage. Okay? And I want you to notice that pattern because it's going to continue through almost everything we read today. Another thing that I want us to look at there is the idea that he commands it and then he says, yet not I but the Lord. This is the first part of verse 10. Some people have used this to point to maybe some questions about the inspiration of Scripture. If Paul's clarifying some of it's from him and some of it's from the Lord, does that mean that the rest of it is just a letter from a guy and we can ignore it? Are some of these rules optional? And I want to point out why that's not the case. So the first thing we're going to see when he says, not I but the Lord, he's quoting from Jesus. Okay? And I want to make sure we recognize that. He's not saying that he just got some different thing that's unique from the rest of his letter. He's saying, remember Jesus taught this when he was walking around face to face with you. The Lord said this. So did Jesus ever say, we shouldn't get divorced, we shouldn't depart from our husband or our wife? Does anybody remember anything like that? It's, it's in a, a fairly famous portion of scripture. It's addressed in the Sermon on the Mount and also in Matthew 19. Verses 6 through 9, Jesus says, So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not men separate. And when he said that, not everybody was comfortable, right? Maybe somebody standing around the circle had violated it. So they asked the question. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? So in the Old Testament law, there was a certificate of divorce that could be granted, and then the marriage was done. And so they're saying, Jesus, why can't we just do that? Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her, who is divorced, commits adultery. Again, it applies to the man and to the woman. Don't get divorced. Marriage is important to God. Okay? And I want to share with you a section of the scripture that may be less familiar that talks about how important marriage is to God. It's in Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 14 through 16. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion, listen to this part, and your wife by covenant. Your wife by covenant. It's a covenant relationship. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? 
And why one? Why does God make a man and a woman one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that you do not deal treacherously. Isn't it interesting in this section on how important marriage is to God that twice he repeats a warning that ostensibly has nothing to do with marriage? Take heed to your spirit. Take heed to your spirit. Your spiritual life equips you to live in a healthy marriage. If your spiritual life is not where it needs to be, if you're not where you should be with God, then you aren't going to be where you should be as a husband or as a wife. And so guard yourself. Don't deal treacherously with your husband, with your wife. Marriage is important to God. Stick with it. Marriage is important to God. Stick with it. And that's the encouragement for all of us today. A lot of us here are married, and your marriage matters to God. Your marriage matters to God. He even tells us why. He seeks godly offspring. God created this world, set it into motion, and he wants to have generation after generation after generation of people who love him. People who are headed to heaven to spend eternity with him. And the model he's instituted on planet earth is to build the framework of a family so that your kids can be raised up with people who love them and love the Lord and communicate truth from generation to generation to generation. And I've seen personally the effects that divorce can have in the kids of divorce. And it confuses their testimony about who Jesus is, about what a covenant relationship means. If everybody can just say, yeah, I'm in a covenant, and then choose out, what does that mean? So we want to be people who are faithful covenant honorers. Marriage is important to God. Stick with it. Okay, and then verse 12. And this is the second part of that confusion about, well, is God talking? Is Paul talking? Is it all the same? Verse 12. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, okay, does that mean everything coming next can just be ignored because it's not the word of God? Anybody buy that? No, good. I'm seeing a lot of no's, and that makes me feel comfortable. I agree with you. He was quoting Jesus before. In this next section, he's not quoting Jesus anymore. Okay, that's all he's saying. It's not like this is B-level Bible, and that was A-level Bible. This was a quotation of Jesus Christ. This is not. If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. Okay? So this is a man who became a Christian, and his wife did not. And so you can imagine the chaos and frustration and stress that would inject into a marriage, right? And so surely some of them were saying, hey, I'm a Christian, she's not, can I just get out of this deal? Can I be done with her? And the same thing is true in the other direction. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Okay, so this is a lady who came to faith in Christ. And remember, her husband is still a part of this immoral culture, probably involved in temple prostitution and all that stuff that was going on in Corinth. And... Paul's saying, hey, stick it out. Coming to faith does not mean leaving your spouse. Coming to faith does not mean leaving your spouse. And we need to talk about this one for a few minutes because I don't think it's something that most people even have a serious question about in our culture today. But back then they did for some significant reasons. The culture was so dark, a lot like ours. There were not standards of morality being upheld universally throughout the culture. In fact, they had really skewed versions of morality, and so people were doing things that were depraved. And you can imagine, coming from that culture, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, your whole life is going to change. And so when someone became a Christian out of that culture, everything changed. Everything was different. And in our culture, it's often less like that, right? For many people, Christianity is something we can bolt onto our week on Sundays. Maybe if we're super Jesus followers, we go to a, a Wednesday night Bible study or something. And the rest of the week, we can be just like everybody else. That was not true then. This was more like what you picture in the Mideast today. When someone steps out and says, I believe in Jesus Christ, they get a symbol put on their door and they get executed. Right? They, they were the outcasts of society. They were taxed extra. They were in prison. They were beaten. All kinds of terrible things were done to people who identified as followers of Jesus Christ. And so imagine in your marriage, you know, you've been living just like the culture around you. Suddenly one of them becomes a Christian. For the Christian, it's going to be super hard because this person's living in sin and you have to tolerate whatever sin they're doing. And to the person who's still engaged in the culture, you're like, what's wrong with this crazy Christian person? 
What happened to the person I married? What's wrong with you? And so obviously there was a problem. But what Paul says, even in the midst of those problems, you have a covenant. Coming to faith does not mean leaving your spouse. So if they're willing to stick around, stick it out with them. Okay? Another thing I want to talk about here is, is just a reminder. He's not talking about people who are dating the non-believer, the person who doesn't trust Jesus Christ, and then decide to get married. Do you know how we know he's not talking about that? In the same letter, he's going to tell you that it's a sin for a believer to marry a non-believer. He's going to warn you, don't marry someone who's not a follower of Jesus Christ. And so this is a different situation. This is, we were both not followers of Jesus Christ. One of us became a Christian and went this way. The other one went this way. Now we have a problem. So if you're the person who's considering marrying someone who is not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're warned independently of this, not to do it. Because the chaos we're talking about in this marriage is the chaos that you're bringing on yourself ahead of time, and you can avoid it entirely. Okay, verse 14. For the unbelieving husband, the person who doesn't follow Jesus Christ, is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife, if the wife doesn't follow Jesus Christ, is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now, they are holy. This is another verse that some people interpret pretty aggressively to mean more than I believe that it means. So does this mean that if... I'm married to a, a non-believing woman, but I follow Jesus Christ. She's magically going to become a Christian and go to heaven, and all our kids are magically going to become a Christian and go to heaven. It doesn't. If it did, there's a whole bunch of Bibles and <laughs> verses that tell us that's not the case. And in fact, Paul tells us later that that's not the case. So what does it mean? It means there are benefits to living with a follower of Jesus Christ. The world may not recognize them. In fact, largely the world doesn't recognize them. And even the other spouse may not recognize them for a time. But if you are a faithful, practicing follower of Jesus Christ, the people who live with you and around you are blessed as a result. And part of that blessing is they're being set apart, that's what sanctified means, set apart from sin and its consequences in this world. And maybe some of you have walked this road a little bit and you know what I'm talking about. I've been raised in homes that were not at all honoring Jesus Christ, and I've been raised in homes that were. And you can instantly tell the difference walking in. Right? So I had stepdads who were alcoholic and abusive and did all kinds of things and never would darken the door of a church. And I experienced the violence and the stress and the chaos of living in that environment. And it's an environment where the kids were not sheltered by the word of God, where God's word was not taught, where there wasn't the love and hope and grace that we talk about in a covenant marriage relationship not because these were terrible human beings but because they weren't following the law of god and they were living out the satisfaction of the appetites they had which is a natural normal thing for human beings to do but if a natural normal human being becomes a follower of jesus christ and submits themselves to the authority of the bible those behaviors have to go away right there's not going to be the alcoholic abusive stepdad if everybody in the family is following Jesus Christ. And that benefit that comes, that separation from sin and its consequences, that to some extent comes from having a follower of Jesus Christ in your house, is a blessing that God gives even to those people who aren't his kids, aren't his followers. Your marriage relationship has spiritual impact on others. Your marriage relationship has spiritual impact on others. It says, otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. And that whole phrasing is weird to us, right? We don't usually talk about people's kids as being unclean. If you want to go start a fight with someone, maybe give it a shot. But I'd encourage you not to. But he's speaking from the Jewish worldview and perspective. There were people of the covenant, God's kids, the Jews, and there were people who weren't, and those people were considered unclean. They didn't follow any of those ceremonial laws or do any of that stuff. They were unclean. They were Gentiles. They were living in their sin. And so he's translating that message now into Christianity. And he's saying, look, if there were no godly influence in the home, then, yeah, those kids would be growing up unclean. They wouldn't have the benefits of the Holy Spirit living there and guiding and directing people. But now, because there's a Christian in the home, they are being set apart. They are hearing truth. They are being exposed to holiness. And this is something that we must remember. In our culture, people don't like to talk about this stuff. It's not politically correct, but it's true, and it matters. 
your marriage relationship does have a spiritual impact on others, right? It's often the things that we view as mundane and common and everyday that are critical to the real mission we're here on earth to perform, right? What's more boring than a marriage, right? We've been married 50 years. We just sit around and be married, and it's the same thing every day. I wake up next to her. She has morning breath, right? She doesn't have makeup on. It's where we live, right? We, over time, you take it for granted. And it just seems like the same old thing, day after day after day. But in reality, marriage is one of the most important investments you can make in your life. It has a spiritual impact, not just on you, not just on your spouse, but on generations of people to come. And I've seen this over and over again. I'm not just talking about words that I'm reading. I'm talking about life experience. One marriage can turn around generations of brokenness. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Kids who were raised in just gross cultures with all kinds of nasty stuff can grow up and make a godly family. And we have the privilege of being a part of that in the one life that we're given right now on planet Earth. You can make a difference in your kids' lives, in your grandkids' lives, and the little neighbor boy who lives across the street from your grandkids. But it takes an investment today. It takes an investment tomorrow. In this boring marriage, so-called, that you live in day after day, it requires a consistent investment. Look at verse 15. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. Okay, so the case may be that this person becomes a follower of Jesus Christ and the husband, the wife says, I want nothing to do with you, I'm out. And this has happened in modern times, I doubt very often in the United States, but it's, it's happened still in other parts of the world. And Paul's direction then is, let them go, you're not under bondage. Not under bondage to what? That is probably the most difficult interpretation part of this whole passage. And I read conflicting uh, opinions on that in several different well-known and respected commentators. So what I believe this is saying is they're not in bondage to abandon their faith in order to keep the marriage covenant together. And I read this from a, a couple of different perspectives. I'm pretty solidly convinced that what it means. that's what it means. So if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So you're a Christian. Your spouse is not. They decide they're done. You don't need to renounce your faith in Jesus Christ and stay in that marriage. That's what it's saying. But God has called us to peace. And Romans 12, 18, which is another letter from Paul, says something similar. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Do you see the recognition that there's a limit to your capacity as a human being? There's a point at which you can be doing everything that you know how to do to live in a peaceable relationship with someone, but they're just not willing to do it. And in some cases, that's exactly what's going to take place. And translating that into something that makes sense to us in this culture, I think, is the commitment to God supersedes all others. The commitment to God supersedes all others. The marriage covenant is critical, and it's vital, and it has spiritual impact for generations to come. But your commitment to God is higher even than that. Your commitment to God is higher even than the marriage covenant. But let's not read too much into that. That doesn't mean that because your husband, wife, is not a follower of Jesus Christ, you can bail out on the commitment that you made, right? He just made that clear in the section that came right before this. But if, if they're going to bail out, you, you can't use violence to keep them in it, and you can't renounce your faith to keep them in it. Does that make sense? So the commitment to God supersedes all others. Verse 16, and here's the amazing part of this message. The last verse we're going to look at together this morning. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? So there's the possibility that this blessing, this benefit that comes from living with a godly person could extend to the salvation of that person's soul. This person may see your faithfulness, right? See how you're so different from the culture in which they live day after day after day and decide they want to invest in the same thing that you're invested in. They want to see the life transformation that's taken over your life take over theirs as well. And I've seen this happen too. I've seen a wife with just a brutal husband who was faithful and faithful and faithful, and finally he turned and came to follow Jesus Christ. And some of you may know stories like that as well. But the sacrifice that goes into that, the faithfulness that goes into that, 
the difficulty that goes into that is something most of us can't even begin to understand. To faithfully pray for that unfaithful husband, that unfaithful wife, to faithfully be an example of love and grace and mercy in the middle of the most difficult circumstances is too much to ask of a person, right? I, I wouldn't ask a person to do that. But God says do it because there's something so much more valuable at stake. You may have 40 years of a really hard road to hoe or 30 years of a really hard road to hoe, but the potential benefit is the salvation of someone's everlasting soul. And if your spouse is here with you, I want to just ask you to take a minute and look at that person. If your spouse is here with you, just take a minute and make eye contact and consider with me, you have the potential to make an eternal impact on that person's life. You have the potential to have an eternal impact on that person's life. And maybe when you first entered into that covenant relationship, you entered into that covenant relationship because he was attractive or she was attractive. And that was the first thing that drew you together. And that's okay. If we're honest, I think for many of us, that's the case. But we entered into something so much more deep than what we consider with these surface level attractions. God put you together with an eternal perspective in mind. That we would have a role in shaping the eternal soul of another human being. God uses people like us to do that. You don't deserve that privilege. I don't deserve to have Sabrina's soul cared for by my hands. That makes no sense. But God entrusts us to do that very work. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? And of course, no human being can literally save another. Jesus Christ did everything that was necessary to save any human being when he suffered and died in our place on a cross. But the instrument he chooses to bring that message into the life of human beings is other human beings. And what an amazing thing that it could be the husband or the wife who shares that message faithfully. And Paul's not the only one, if you're thinking this is some crazy idea. Peter wrote the same thing, 1 Peter 3.1. Wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. The way you live your life can have an impact on the eternal destiny of your husband or your wife. What a responsibility and what a privilege. James 5.20 says, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. All these verses call us to the same thing. Invest in your marriage with eternal vision. Invest in your marriage with eternal vision. Because our marriages are so common and we can view them as a mundane thing, a thing that can be taken for granted, we overlook the fact that this is one of the most powerful tools God has given us to invest in eternity. Right? Many marriages will turn out children. And it, the Bible told us that God wants godly marriages to turn out godly offspring. People who will grow up to follow God because they saw mom and dad following God. Our marriages are worthy of investment because they impact eternity. And one concern I have the whole couple of weeks I've been looking at this section is, man, someone could walk away from this message with the idea that, yeah, my marriage is boring and it's difficult, but I need to gut it out. I need to stick it out because that's what the Bible says. And there will be days in your marriage where that is true, where you feel like you're just gutting it out. You're just toughing it out and you're doing it because that's what God wants you to do. But if you do that, you'll be faithful. There are other days, and I hope more of these, when you take a time and reflect a little bit and consider the privilege, the responsibility you have of investing in that person. Investing in that person, not just for today or tomorrow because you want them to be in a good mood so that you can get what you want from them, but so you can have a healthy relationship that honors God and becomes a blessing to your kids and the neighbor kids and their schools, and your community, and reaches out around the world. It all starts with healthy, God-honoring marriages. Amen. And you know what? There's, there's an old joke. I don't even know exactly how it goes, but I have the gist of it. Something to do with a husband marries a woman hoping she'll never change, and a wife marries a husband hoping she's going to change him. Right? And, and the simple fact is that both of them are going to change, but the husband doesn't immediately change in the direction the wife wants him to change. And the wife probably doesn't immediately change in the direction the husband would like for her to change either. And so 
these people 2,000 years ago in their culture were experiencing significant change in their marriage. And they're saying, hey, Paul, is there a way out? Can I hit the buzzer and tap out and be done? And Paul said, no. Marriage is critical to God. Stick it out. So how much more important is it for us today, living in a culture that rejects marriage as the Bible defines it, living in a culture where many people just choose to never even bother with marriage, and where we redefine marriage to include other people that were not included in what God gave to us, how much more important is that we who are followers of Jesus Christ live out this model of investing in our marriages with eternal vision? Some of us may feel that enough changes have come, enough difficulties have come that I've earned the right, I deserve to be happy, it's time for me to get out. And I shared with you the examples of a whole bunch of people in our culture who chose that exact path. There's a storm, our house is blown up, I'm done. I'm away from you, we're done. Celebrities who said, oh, he changed, she changed. I'm not in that relationship anymore. But even today, there are examples of the opposite. And as we get ready to conclude our time together, I want to share with you a video that's going to demonstrate to you an example of someone who chose differently. Uh, the, the video we're going to watch is a resignation speech. This gentleman was the president of a prestigious university and for some reason he decided to resi resign his position. I want, to see you, I want you to see what led him to, to that decision. I haven't in my life experienced easy decision making on major decisions, but uh, one of the simplest and clearest decisions I've had to make is this one, because circumstances dictated it. Uh, Muriel, now, uh, in the last couple of months, seems to be almost happy when with me, and almost never happy when not with me. In fact, she seems to feel trapped, becomes very fearful, sometimes almost terror, and when she can't get to me, there can be anger. She's in distress. But when I'm with her, she's happy and contented. And so I must be with her at all times. And you see, it's not only that I promised in sickness and in health till death do us part. And I'm a man of my word. But as I have said, I don't know with this group, but I've said publicly it's the only fair thing she sacrificed for me for 40 years to make my life possible. So, if I cared for her for 40 years, I'd still be in debt. However, there's much more. It's not that I have to, it's that I get to. I love her very dearly, and you can tell it's not easy to talk about. She's a delight. It's a great honor to care for such a wonderful person. That man's name is Robertson McQuilkin. He was very prestigious, like I said, president of a university. And his career was everything he had worked for his whole life. But his wife had Alzheimer's and dementia. And he decided that the commitment that he made to his wife, as you just saw, was more valuable, more important than all the fame and prestige that came with being the president of a university and writing books and all the things he did. And so he put all the fame and all that stuff away and said, I'm going to honor my commitment to this woman. Do you see how different that is from the conception of marriage that exists in our culture today? And if we want to honor what we read today from the Apostle Paul, if we want to live lives that are pleasing to God, if we want to make our mark on eternity, we need to have a commitment to marriage that looks more like that and less like what you're reading about in People magazine. And so the charge for all of us today is invest in your marriage with eternal vision. Invest in that person when you don't think they deserve it. Invest in that person when you're tired, when it's been a long day. With grace and humility, continue, continue. And I know it's hard. I'm relatively young for some of you, and I've only been married for a little over 20 years. But already we've experienced days where that's a hard thing. But I've learned it's worth it. And there are people in this congregation who've done that through a lifetime. Look to those folks who are role models, who walked with their spouse every day of their life here on earth, and ask them for their help, ask them for their guidance. God surrounded us with people who have been incredible role models of how to live out a godly marriage. Take your cues from them and not from magazines and TV shows. Invest in your marriage with eternal vision. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of marriage. I thank you for the gift you've given me of being part of one. And I pray for each person here who's in a marriage, Lord, and I ask that you would help them to invest with eternity in mind. Help them to pour their lives out for their spouses. Help me to pour my life out for Sabrina and for our children. Lord, make this church a church of healthy marriages, that we would be like a light shining on a hill, that people can see there's a better way to do this. God's way really is the best. And Lord, I thank you for the men and women, even here this morning, who walked with a partner every day of their life. Lord, let us follow that example. (coughs) Encourage them. Thank you for what they've done, Lord. Thank you for their faithfulness. And Lord, let those of us who are younger follow that same path. Let us follow the examples of men like Robertson McQuilkin, who was willing to set aside everything that most people are living for, the fame, the money, the popularity, in order to honor a simple promise he made to a woman 40 years ago. Lord, let us honor the covenants you've placed us in. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.